welcome to uh, the Yale School of the Environment at the moment. You've got the nice warm tones of the, the wood next to you. You can sort of see some of it behind me here. You're stepping up into Burke Auditorium. You're going to get settled. You're sitting down. You're maybe next to a green banker for somebody else from the loan program's office. There's another individual, you know, from academia. There's somebody from a local municipality. There's a you know commercial real estate developer there. You're all huddled together and you're rubbing elbows and you're excited about Green Resilience Hub. So we're excited to have you here. Um, people are filing in. We're going to get started um, in just a little bit. My name is Stuart DeCue. I'm the executive director of the Yale Center for Business and the Environment. I'm a lecturer at the School of the Environment. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, the Yale Center for Business Environment is a joint initiative between the Yale School of Management um, and the Yale School of the Environment. Uh, and we've had the pleasure over an um, extended number of years of working with uh, a range of students um, who have incredible talent, curiosity, and skill. Um, and they have time, too, where they then you know, reconnect and apply that towards some of the most interesting and challenging questions um, that are out there. And then sometimes when all the right pieces come together, um, you get a product like what we're going to explore and look at and talk about today with these report authors. Um, so just a few housekeeping items before we get into this. Um, first, we are going to have about 30, 35 minutes of presentation here from the report authors. Um, and uh, once Sarah, Maggie, and Max um, are finished, like we will really want to dig into your questions. Um, so feel free to geek out with us, get into the model, get into the details. Like we'd love to talk about and explore those. Um, so that's where the Q and A function of the chat comes in. So feel free as you're hearing the the conversation, you know, put those in, um, and we'll be you know reminding you throughout that um, as well um, and prompting it. Um, uh, and the other element is we have a lot of people to thank um, for this kind of first, you know, the, the report authors and I'll introduce them in just a sec. But, you know, this is really a product of both partnership and kind of an engagement over time um, with the Connecticut Green Bank. Um, and if you aren't familiar with the Connecticut Green Bank, I mean, one of the most remarkable like policy market based organizations that's out there. They won essentially the Nobel Prize of Public Policy a number of years ago, the Ash Award. Um, they have inspired really a lot of the kind of models that we look at at the federal level um, for how we can do the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, you know, explore solar programs for low to middle income communities and accelerate those, be able to design and develop new markets um, and new, you know, financing products. Um, to be able to accelerate the market um, for clean energy. Um, remarkable group of individuals who also offer their time to other people. Um, and so we've had the pleasure of working with them over an extended period at the Yale Center for Business and the Environment and invaluable advice um, and guidance from the team at uh, the Connecticut Green Bank to make this happen. And, you know, really in particular, Sarah, Mariana, and Luis, like if, if they're on, I haven't seen, but just incredibly talented people in their innovation um, and project finance groups that were able to guide the team here. And Brian Garcia, who's a close partner, alum of the Yale School of the Environment, um, who wrote the, the forward of this report. Um, also just huge thanks. And then we also have a number of alumni who helped build parts of the model that you see here. Um, uh, Zach Ratner and Alex McRae from a few years ago helped really set the foundation for the battery storage model. Amazing folks. And then one of the classmates of this incredibly talented group, Kyle, was also invaluable in that as well. So just a huge community that's done this. Um, and it really took the work of these three individuals. So when I'm standing here right now at the School of the Environment and they're all spread out in different places, like they spent hours and hours on end in a conference room just around the corner from me, like grinding on this and thinking about every bit and aspect of the business model, the energy model, the financial model, and like didn't give up on it. And just like were incredibly curious, had built on like years of study and just spent their time and energy far beyond the independent studies or classwork that they had done here. And so we think this is really a model of where graduate students with incredible talent and peers that they can connect with that have complementary skills and experience, you know, 
I look at these folks as like the 101st, 102nd, and 103rd experts in the world on resilience hubs, or maybe more than that, because who else has explored this? And these are folks who are, you know, just emerging as, you know, kind of professionals coming out into the world um, and in the kind of growth phase of their career. And so I'm deeply appreciative of their time and effort. They've done incredible work here. And I'm just excited to listen to this as well, having read the report and been a part of this over time. But you know, Sarah, Maggie, and Max, thank you for your time in doing this, um, putting it together, um, and for, you know, all the intellectual talent, creativity, and, and great teamwork that you brought to this. So this is theirs. Enjoy the next hour um, with them. They're incredibly bright. Please ask questions um, and push and probe on the model. And I'll turn it over to Sarah to get us started here. Great, thank you to Stu for that very warm welcome. I agree, this was a really fun project for all of us to work on. Um, and the three of us are really excited to share with you today uh, our recently published work on Green Resilience Hubs. Uh, so Max and I will be presenting and then Maggie will be moderating the Q&A and helping us answer questions at the end. But a little bit more background on this is that um, the three of us in our last semester of graduate school wanted to put our heads together with uh, Seed Bay and the Connecticut Green Bank um, and study something that really was a capstone to everything we had learned in grad school, along with everything that we've learned in our careers thus far. Um, we had a lot of interest in the Inflation Reduction Act, um, the ITC bonuses that were unlocked recently. Uh, we all wanted to um, do more modeling and uh, really think about this question of building resilience with clean energy. So. On the front page of our report and, and also here is, is a photo that was taken recently uh, just a few months ago in Vermont when they experienced uh, devastating levels of flooding. So I think this, uh, you know, underscores the need to um, build resilient infrastructure in the U.S. and, and beyond. So our vision uh, overall for this project is, is broad. Um, it's a world where all communities have access to clean and reliable energy systems. Um, so we're starting uh, with the case study in Connecticut with the Connecticut Green Bank, um, but really the, the, the vision is, is quite large. Um, so our goal to move that vision forward uh, is to offer insights to developers and investors. So um, if you identify as one of those or if you're in any part uh, of developing clean energy projects. Uh, we hope that this report and the presentation offer you insights so that you might take the next step uh, and think about resiliency in your portfolios. To really you know, drive this point home, uh, resiliency is really important. Uh, on an annual basis, outages cost between 25 and $70 billion uh, for the US economy. Uh, and Hurricane Sandy alone had an economic impact upwards of $50 billion by some estimates. And, you know, beyond those economic impacts, there's a, a very devastating um, impact um, on human life. Uh, hundreds of people died in the Texas winter storm. Hundreds of people died in Hurricane Sandy. Uh, and even around 50 people died during Hurricane Sandy directly related to power outages. Um, and that's because a lot of folks in this country and everywhere depend on um, medical equipment that require access to power. So um, this really you know, demonstrates that um, when we don't have uh, reliable and resilient uh, energy systems, uh, there are very real impacts. So um, to tackle this um, enormous goal uh, and to move this um, vision forward, here's our agenda for today. Um, so we'll start with background on what is a green resilience hub? Uh, we spent a good bit of the first part of the semester um, just exploring this question. And then we'll get into the methods of um, how do you calculate the revenues and expenses um, for this type of technology? Uh, and then Max will bring us through our results and take us through uh, our major conclusions. So here are our initial research questions. Um, again, first, uh, what is a green resilience hub and where should they be developed? I will call out here, there's a lot in our report that's not included in our presentation, so definitely check that out. Um, but I will go over that a bit here. Um, secondly, what are the costs and revenues for a green resilience hub? Um, again, uh, you know, we 
um, explored this question and ultimately decided on creating an hourly energy model, um, which was quite the endeavor. And then um, lastly, how do federal and state incentives help the financial case for green resilience hubs? So we were interested in the ITC bonuses um, uh, enabled by the Inflation Reduction Act. So uh, we wanted to explore, you know, with the increased um, room you might have in a project from those bonuses, how can that be reinvested in resiliency? Um, also, here in Connecticut, we have a state incentive program for batteries. So we wanted to model that and see um, also how that helps the financial case for these hubs. Okay, so by now you're probably really wondering, what is a green resilience hub? Um, so first and foremost, green resilience hubs are community-based. So when you think about um, where to develop one of these, uh, it should be in a place that already convenes the community. So this should be a place folks go for energy assistance, uh, for food assistance, or somewhere that people attend events that, that build community in their area. And the reason behind that is during a natural disaster, you want people to go somewhere that they already go to access resources. Secondly, um, green resilience hubs are obviously resilience building. So in the event of a natural disaster, this is somewhere people can go to, you know, use their medical equipment, um, plug in their phones and be able to communicate, have access to uh, life-saving heating and cooling amongst other sorts of resources like refrigeration. Um, and then lastly, for the purposes of this exercise, we wanted to look at how clean energies, uh, clean energy technologies can bolster resilience. So you can definitely build resilience with fossil fuels, with a generator, um, but we wanted to see how the ITC um, tax incentive adders um, can mean that clean energy can be used to build that resilience. Another really important thing to understand about green resilience hubs is that they switch between these two modes. So you have normal operation versus the resiliency mode. So in normal operation, you have normal weather patterns, um, your battery is dispatching to the grid and earning revenue. Um, the solar is also exporting to the grid and, and potentially earning that metering credit. So uh, essentially you're actively interacting with um, the broader grid system. However, in resiliency mode, uh, your microgrid would uh, do what's called islanding. So it would uh, no longer be able to interact with the grid. Um, this is really important in an in a outage um, to be able to islands to have that level of resiliency. So in this scenario, your battery is only used for backup. Um, your operations shift to critical loads. So that means you might not be backing up every circuit in your building. You might only be backing up things like heating and cooling and refrigeration or like a common area. And then the solar uh, in turn is only used for either self-consumption or charging the battery. And just to go over um, how we grounded our analysis. Uh, we used the Connecticut Green Bank, who was our partner in this uh, project, as the case study. So they're located here in Connecticut uh, in Hartford on actually a campus that houses a number of nonprofits, um, including organizations like Operation Fuel, which uh, offers energy assistance to low-income folks here in the state. Um, there's an affordable housing um, on site, so we thought this was a really great place um, to act as a case study uh, on how these things work. Um, we modeled the investment tax credit and the uh, Connecticut Energy Storage Solutions Program as incentives. Our technologies included both rooftop and carport solar, along with a battery system under a microgrid. For the modeling tool, we used Excel. Um, this both you know, aligned with our skill set. We thought about the potential of you know, learning Python for this, but we thought, since uh, financial modeling often happens in Excel and it aligned with our skill set, that's what we ended up doing. All right, so um, I will now go over uh, a very broad overview of our methods. Um, and this is a schematic essentially of what the model we created, what it does. So we sourced um, load and generation data from publicly available sources uh, with NREL. We created a battery logic within the Excel model, and that created um, our inter hourly energy model. So that means 
we had numbers on uh, the production and performance of this theoretical system for every hour of an entire year. And once you combine that with information on utility rates, you know, the model has the ability to calculate um, time varying pricing. It has the ability to calculate demand charges. Um, once you combine that with the hourly energy model, um, you can understand what the utility bills are. Uh, we also, you know, used information on the state and federal incentives and uh, used a bunch of research and experience uh, to create our cost assumptions. Uh, so once you combine the, the energy model with uh, the additional information, it spits out our results. So our results include things like, what are the revenues for this hub? What are the rates of return before and after tax incentives? And then we ran a number of sensitivities on this model. Now, I, I promise to keep it really high level and I will uh, keep that promise, but I did wanna give you guys um, a brief overview of what some of these things look like. So starting with the battery logic. This is a visual representation of what the battery is doing in the model over the course of a few days. So here in green, you have um, the state of charge of the battery in every hour. Any of the positive lines here uh, represent that battery charging. So it's charging both from the solar and from the grid. It charges from the solar when, um, if there's excess solar production after self-consumption, it charges the battery. Um, and if there's excess after that, then that solar then exports to the grid to uh, potentially earn that metering credits. Anything that's a negative is that battery discharging. So here's the passive discharge program um, related to the, the state incentives. And then there's also an active discharge program here. And then when the battery is not um, doing either of those things, it can also do peak shaving, which is uh, over here. Okay, so um, here's a visual representation, representation of what the hourly energy model looks like. So over the course of four days here, uh, we have a bunch of different load curves. You start with the load curve in blue, which is you know, how much the campus is using in electricity um, every hour. Then you have the load curve after you add the generation of the solar system, which is here in orange. So you can see, you know, the solar is producing during the day um, and it is reducing that uh, demand curve during those hours. Then you add the battery logic, uh, which gives you the final load curve in gray. So the battery is, you know, discharging for that incentive program I talked about, it's peak shaving. So that reduces the demand um, even further. And then it also charges overnight. So it actually increases the demand curve um, over the nighttime hours. So the system is effectively, it's reducing demand, it's shifting load, um, it's managing the peak and it's doing a lot here. And then the last thing I'll say, um, and there's a lot of information on this slide is, is a brief discussion of how we calculated our revenues and values. Um, again, you know, check out our report and our model for more information, but I'll do an overview of, of what all of these things mean. So. Starting on the left, um, both the solar and the storage system offer a value of self-consumption. So uh, this is the idea that every kilowatt hour that you consume from the system is a kilowatt hour that you don't have to purchase from the utility. Uh, and there's a, an hourly dollar value to that. Um, the solar and the storage also uh, can help you with demand charges. So if you are a commercial entity or uh, industrial um, entity that has demand charges, if the solar is producing during your peak, then that can re reduce your demand charge. Um, similar if the storage is dispatching at that time, that can help save you money on that part of your bill. Since we also have you know, the hourly performance of the storage system, we can calculate the state incentives, um, performance-based incentives for the battery. Um, and then, uh, you know, again, we, we have numbers on how much the solar is exporting to the grid, so we can calculate the net metering credits uh, for the solar system. And then over here on the right, uh, we have these values in parentheses, and that's because these values are, you know, A, very difficult to quantify, and B, not generally included in a financial model, um, but definitely worth discussion. So um, the storage in the microgrid offer um, the value of avoided costs and resiliency. And that um, 
is difficult to quantify in part because it depends what perspective you're looking at it from. So if you're a utility, that could be um, the avoided cost of uh, restoring power to a certain part of the grid within a certain time frame, especially if you're a utility that is subject to uh, performance-based uh, regulations. If you're a business, that's the value of being able to run your business um, during an outage. Or if you are uh, you know, an individual, it's the value of um, not having the, all the food in your fridge go bad or uh, the value of being able to access um, heating and cooling and potentially, you know, stay safe and healthy. Um, again, you know, very difficult to put uh, numbers on those. And then lastly, the value here on the right, system efficiencies. So um, this is really about, you know, assuming that you are sizing for resiliency. If you're buying a battery for backup, um, you can buy a much smaller battery if you have solar connected to that battery, because that would recharge, the, the solar recharges the battery in an outage. Um, and also if you are designing the system in a microgrid, um, and we do have numbers on this, but um, you can get a smaller battery uh, with a campus because instead of backing up each building separately, um, you're able to, to share um, the production from the so different solar systems and actually get a smaller battery as well. So um, I hope that was uh, not too confusing, but if you are interested in the nuts and bolts of this, I definitely recommend downloading the model that we created and watching the, the video that Max and I recorded. Um, I definitely also uh, put questions in the chat and we'll do our best to explain them uh, if you have anything related to the methods. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Max uh, to go over our results. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Sarah. That was a truly brilliant explanation of our background and methodology. Uh, so to start this off, I'm going to try and stay out of the numbers too much, but I do want to mention that we are talking uh, about a lot of acronyms here. And the first acronym is the IGC, which is the investment tax credit, which is laid out in the IRA or the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, and then the second one that I'm going to say a lot, or I guess third, um, is the, uh, what was my third? Oh, I don't remember. Um, is IRR, inherent rate of return. Um, and so I just want you all to know what that means. And that's just a measure of how well a financial model is performing. Um, so here's our system design. We, um, to sort of simplify things, we modeled five different, um, you know, system projects. Um, so we looked at three different battery sizes, a 250, 500, and 1,000 kilowatt hour battery. And then we also looked at um, what the system would look like with only solar or only storage. Um, next slide, please, Sarah. Um, and so I guess for some color, this is sort of how, this is part of our decision-making process when we're thinking about a battery is we're really having to trade off resilience and cost. And so you get a lot more benefits with a bigger battery. You can back up longer, you can do more peak shaving, um, but cost is really dramatic. And these batteries are very expensive, especially at the scale that we're talking about for something smaller, like a green resilience hub on you know, a small corporate or multifamily campus. Um, and so I guess uh, our battery that we sort of looked at as our sweet spot is about right here. Um, and what this means is that we can back up about 75% of our load with our 500 kilowatt hour battery for one day or 25% for three days. And that was kind of our way of saying, okay, we think that 25% is reasonable. We talked to a lot of people about this. And then, okay, 25% gets you refrigerators. It will um, allow you to power important medical devices. It will allow you to heat or cool you know, communal spaces to keep people safe during extreme heat or extreme cold emergencies. And so we felt like this was kind of a, a reasonable trade-off. All right, next slide, please. Um, and so here are, I guess, initial system design sensitivity results. And so we have all five project types laid out here. And um, it's a big chart, but some of the more important things are to the right. And so um, if we're looking, what we find is that tax incentives and tax credits are really important. 
And we're really only generating positive returns that are worth looking at uh, once we're leveraging this project, once we're taking on debt, and also after we're getting those tax incentives. Um, and so this chart has some really important things on it also. Um, solar, basically, in this yellow bar, we can see it's outperforming every other project type. And so that kind of means that our uh, our battery is dragging down the financial performance of this project a little bit, even though we consider it a critical part of any green resilience hub. And then um, also we see that our uh, there's kind of a cascade of financial viability going from um, with solar and storage small being the highest and then medium being in the middle and large being the lowest. And so your financial performance decreases as you build in more resilience and as you build a larger battery. And then interestingly, to the far right of our chart, we're looking at nonprofit IRR. So in our model, um, we included this really important part of the Inflation Reduction Act that allows for direct pay of tax credits that used to only be available through complex schemes with investment banks and tax credits. And, um, and so now it has become a lot more simple, which means that nonprofits, churches, community organizations, schools can invest in these projects and receive the tax credit paid for by the Inflation Reduction Act. And so this is really huge and we think might unlock a lot of these projects. Um, but it does mean that you get slightly lower returns, mostly because you don't benefit from the tax write-offs if you're not a taxable entity. Okay, next slide. So here are kind of financial assumptions and I'm not gonna go through all of these in huge detail. They're all in the model. We're gonna publish this webinar and our slides later. But um, the one really important one is our storage costs. And that was a major, major driver of the performance of these projects. And storage is really expensive. We use a value of $1,200 per kilowatt hour. All of these values we got from the Green Bank, we got from online resources, and we also got from talking to experts in the field. So we talked to people who are experts in microgrids you know, at the utilities, and for example. Uh, but what's really important to know is that um, I, solar prices aren't going to come down much for um, your carport and rooftop solar. But storage prices are going to vary depending on your scale of your project. And there, there's a lot of efficiency when you scale, um, which, which can really help the financial viability of your project. Uh, we'll go to the next slide, Sarah. So here are other financial assumptions. Nothing that interesting. We kind of use what we thought was a, a prevailing interest rate of 6%. Um, it might be possible to do better that than that if you go and partner with your local green bank, for example. Um, okay. And so now we are getting into kind of the meat of it. So um, we're looking at upside and downside risk here. And so it's important to think about our downside risk when building these projects. And what we're finding is that, yeah, there's, there's exposure to downside if your battery price goes up your project can tank and you can really drop your IRR to negative returns. Um, but there's also a lot of upside uh, potential, which is exciting. Notably, however, we should be really thinking about this downside as interest rates in our macroeconomic environment starts to push things more toward a downside scenario for some of these, these cases. Um, Okay, and so uh, this is kind of where we're getting into the Inflation Reduction Act and how important it is for these projects. So these are all of the um, ITC, Investment Tax Credit Adders, laid out in the IRA. And so um, the baseline is a 20%, and then we kind of assumed a 10% domestic content adder. Um, we did not model for the increased costs that might come with this, but um, there, there may be some increased costs with sourcing your components from the United States. But the other ones are really exciting and we, we feel that they, they can offer a lot of potential for developing green resilience hubs in communities that need it most. And so um, there are adders targeted at energy communities or brownfield redevelopments, which we think that the Connecticut Green Bay K 
case study may qualify for because it's based on an old horseshoe nail factory, which went through some major brownfield redevelopment and is a very cool campus. Um, other exciting um, prospects are tribal lands, low income and different low income projects. Notably, the bottom um, number five has a 20% ITC adder, which can really change a project, but it also requires sharing the financial benefits with the households. Um, and so this was this is a toggle that we built into our model. And so we can kind of see what profit sharing looks like in this scenario. So, and here's where we start to get very excited about the viability of these projects. And what we're seeing really here is that I know 30%, you know, the your IRR is positive, but it's not, I don't think any developers are going to be looking at that seriously. But if you can look at projects at 40 or 50% ITC, these projects start to appear very bankable and very financeable. Um, and so this really, this means that one, the Inflation Reduction Act is going to be really important for you know building these green resilience hubs. Um, and also that these projects should be targeted at the places that the Inflation Reduction Act is focusing on for developing projects like this and bringing green and renewable energy. Uh, next slide, please, Sarah. So here's a um, picture, here's a view of our value stack for our project. So over the 20 year sort of projected lifetime of this project, this is where all of the revenues are coming from. And so the biggest chunk at the bottom is energy bill savings. And what that looks like is your demand charges. So you pay a reduced fee based on the maximum amount of power you're drawing at any one time. So that will go down because we have a battery in um, solar. But then there's also reduced consumption of energy. And so um, because we're installing solar. And so that's the bulk of our value here. The next phase chunk is the investment tax credit from the IRA. And that's, as we can see, a really important one. And that will grow or shrink depending on how many adders in the IRA you can satisfy. Some other important ones are tax depreciation. That's going to go away if you're a nonprofit or a school or another non-taxable entity. Um, and then finally at the top is the Connecticut storage solutions. And so that's a pretty small sliver, but it was important for project viability. And so it's important to think about um, kind of in your state, what incentives are available for your battery to help get it paid for. And at the top, it, if it was there, would be excess energy sales. We, this project, our case study, not do any net exporting to the grid however your project might. And so that's an important thing to consider when developing one of these projects. All right. So now you touched into the conclusion a little bit there, but I'll take you through some of our, our major findings. So to start off with limitations, um, is our tool, we're a little hamstrung by Excel. We, our model, I love it. I think it's amazing. Um, I'm really excited about it and I hope everyone else is too, but it is, we are pushing the limits of Excel, frankly. Um, and it's not perfectly optimized. And um, we, we found ourselves limited in our capacity to run the really interesting things like the uh, sensitivity analyses, which really tell us, okay, but what happens if we can lower battery costs by this much or, you know, um, we kind of had to take a guess and check method when optimizing our battery size, but there, there are better ways to do this. And one thing that we think could be really interesting, especially if there are any grad students on here or listening, um, Stu, we hope you also might, might push for another independent study team to do this, is taking this model into Python and building a tool. Um, we, we tried to make this model really accessible for everyone, but we would love to see it turn into a tool that you know, practitioners could click on and could put in their location and load the NREL um, databases and, you know, add, okay, is this an energy community? You know, check an extra 10% on the ITC and then kind of come up with a rough estimate. And so we think that there's a lot more power that you could get out of this with a different um, kind of platform. So second, um, okay, I see Kate York or a paid position. Thank you, Kate. I agree. Um, so second um, is policy. Uh, there's a lot of perceived risk around the ITC adders. And at this point, I 
Um, I think that it's difficult to envision anyone really banking on receiving a more than a 30% investment tax credit for these projects. And so, you know, as these projects gain steam and as people sort of figure out the ins and outs of getting these ITC adders, I think there'll be a lot more confidence in these. And I think that um, we'll start to see a lot more momentum um, being built for developing these kinds of projects that are sort of borderline and may rely on that 40 or 50% investment tax credit. Finally, another thing that we didn't really get a great chance to look at, um, we did think about it a little bit, was other creative revenue sources. Uh, you know, most of the, yeah, there's so much value to resilience that Sarah talked about. And um, places like FEMA or insurance providers really are going to benefit from projects like this. And so it's feasible to envision a world where um, these, these organizations are compensating for the increased level of resilience that you would be building into your community by developing a green resilience hub. Um, and finally, we only looked at clean technologies. We wanted to keep it battery solar. Um, however, it is cheaper to build a generator and you know, either diesel or natural gas. Those are both pretty reliable fuel sources. And so you can build in resilience for a little bit less money with one of those technologies or even a fuel cell. But it doesn't really satisfy the, the clean clean technology mandate that we really wanted to explore and look at and doesn't um, allow you access to the investment tax credit from the IRA. Okay, next slide. So to wrap this up, we have some major takeaways. Um, cannot trust this enough. The IRA ITC is so important. And when these projects start to get developed, these will be really important. Um, components of your value stack. Um, state programs are also going to be really important. We're not totally sure what uh, we don't. We haven't done a survey of all of the state incentive programs, but I know that there are incentives in states like Colorado. We know that there's a great one that we kind of detailed um, in Connecticut, and that's built into our model. So if you're a Connecticut developer, you should um, check that out. Another thing is battery costs are sort of prohibitive or building anything larger than the bare minimum to keep projects running. Um, battery costs have gone up and hopefully will go down. And also there's enormous economies of scale here that you can tap into if you're developing a battery project. And lastly, something that was really interesting was just solar is heavily subsidizing storage in this project. Um, solar returns are uh, looked a lot better than solar and storage returns. And so it it's kind of important to think about the relative value of trading off. Okay, do we want clean energy? Do we want to reduce um, emissions? Do we want to have cleaner air around us? Or is this resilience also really important? And is it worth kind of paying the, the battery price for resiliency? Um, another thing that we think is so important are the positive externalities from these projects. Um, you know, kind of, those peak loads that you are shaving can um, can result in some of the dirtiest emissions from power plants, from peaker plants that are burning, you know, these old coal and oil fired plants that turn on a couple of times a year. By installing a battery, you can really help prevent those plants from turning on. And that keeps our communities cleaner, that keeps air cleaner, keeps children safer. There's a ton of value to installing these renewable energy technologies for your community that really just are not valued, cannot be valued financially in, in these models and you don't get revenue from them. And lastly, Sarah talked about this um, and did a really good job is we found something that we found really interesting was the microgrid advantage, which was that by tying together sort of complementary load curves from our multifamily residential and then our commercial spaces, because they're peaking at different points, um, and by tying the solar together, you can save a lot of money on your battery system and you can make it, you can build a much smaller battery, you can get the same resilience and you can save money. Uh, microgrids have a cost and they're expensive and they're specialized technology, but in this case, we found it worth it. And so it's an important thing to think about kind of the, the structure of what your project would look like um, if you're thinking about developing these. And then lastly, location is so important. Connecticut is not the sunniest place in the United States. Um, 
pro these projects might look a lot different in Arizona or California or Texas. And also, um, you know, there's location to the different subsidies that we tapped into. So and the battery storage subsidies were were important, but not so, but we're not a, a major proportion of our value stack. Um, however, location is going to be crucial for getting any of those Inflation Reduction Act matters to your ITC. So if you want a 50% ITC for your project, it's going to be very, very location dependent. Um, lastly, we uh, we looked at something called energy arbitrage, where you buy energy at off-peak rates and sell it at on-peak rates. In Connecticut, um, there's not enough of a price differential to achieve that in our case study. But in other locations, there are companies that are successfully paying for batteries through energy arbitrage. And so that's a, another place to look for revenue streams that, that we did not tap into for modeling this project. Um, and I think that's about it on our takeaways. So again, a final thank you to the team at the Green Bank that we work really closely with over um, quite a few months. Mariano, Luis, and Sarah, thank you, thank you. Um, you were so instrumental. And then team at CBay, Stuart DeQ was our um, independent study advisor, and we could have not done this without him. And he opened up so many connections and guided us through this process. Heather was absolutely instrumental in getting this webinar and this project published. So thank you. And then our phone a friend, we were struggling to figure out what to call Kyle because he played such an important role in this project um, and truly saved our model from catastrophe countless. And so he, he deserves a very special thanks. Um, and I think that's it. And we're gonna open it up to questions unless Sarah or Maggie has anything else to say. I have nothing else to say on the sharing of our materials point. Happy to transition to the Q and A. If Sarah, you have anything you want to add? No, ready to take questions. Okay, great. And I have to say, I just wanted to add, yeah, this was a really meaningful project to work on. We've made that very clear, but um, I think I I've won. I had a life goal, which is to get an introduction by Stu. <laughs> I've always wanted to get a formal introduction by Stu, so that was cool. Okay, let's open our first question. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna read them and then Max and Sarah, please uh, raise your hand if you'd like to answer this or I or I will. Uh, so you mentioned this briefly, but I wanted to hear more about whether you think resilience is a value that you believe is adequately priced into the revenue streams associated with this type of project, or whether you think state or federal policy changes are needed to sufficiently compensate for the benefits of islanding and critical load production in emergencies. Definitely have a lot of thoughts on that, but I will open it to you two first. All right, I guess I will take this. Um, no, I don't think that this um, resilience is adequately priced in at all. Um, and that's kind of one of our major takeaways is that we, we are looking at so much value for communities with these projects. We're looking at saving lives. Um, we're looking at people who during, you know, those Texas blackouts or Hurricane Sandy may not have died due to cold exposure or to loss of life-saving medical equipment. And so um, in that way, it's not priced in. And there's not really any payments that we were able to incorporate into this model directly related to the resiliency. Um, there are payments that kind of are a byproduct of it, like saving your peak demand, but no one, no one is actually paying directly for resilience. And that's uh, that's a major question that we were, um, kind of wrestled with is like, where, where could we find this? How much is resilience valued? And how could that be incorporated as a value stream? Do you have any other thoughts, Sarah? Yeah, I mean, um, I think that incentives specifically for resilience would be really great. Um, we sort of mentioned this too, but yeah, like getting insurance companies um, to to pay for resilience because, you know, if you are insuring a home or like a person's health and they uh, live in a place that has access to a green resilience hub, um, then you're much less likely to have to, to pay out vast amounts of money when that... Um, if that home, you know, gets um, the power cut out or if that person gets really ill um, during um, 
power outage. So there are definitely, there's definitely room for more incentives for resiliency specifically. Um, and then also we think that there's additional revenue streams um, for people who, who can price resilience. Yeah, super important. The point, especially on uh, changing the way that we think about uh, insurance and how we how we build for uh, effective insurance policies. I, a last point I wanted to make was the point of, uh, just on FEMA and our how our policy structure is designed to uh, create incentives really for a reactive uh, distribution of resources. So meaning like you know in the example of Texas or 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 X natural disaster. Uh, we have uh, resources to go into communities and, and help them rebuild, but it, there's nothing that's proactive, right? So if you could, we could somehow create policy structures that either through a tax credit, um, you know, create a financial incentive to build resilience or just, or, or give communities uh, money ahead of time to build these types of uh, resilience-based projects, that would be something I also think is important. I'm going to move on to the next question. Uh, most investors and developers do not like to share their financial and economic modeling tools publicly. What was the impetus behind releasing this type of model, and what do you see? Uh, what do you see as the primary beneficiaries? Who do you see as the primary beneficiaries? I can start on this one. Um, I was just smiling because, um, I, yeah, I I find this. Um, question uh, really great. Um, Stu, who was our advisor, kind of at the outset encouraged us to create a publicly available tool. I think that's the sort of the benefit of doing this as an academic exercise. We were all graduate students and I think like performing or creating this tool within the context of um, working in private industry would look very different. But uh, working through the Center for Business and the Environment, it's, it was really important to us and them um, to publish what we were working on. Um, there are definitely downsides to having a publicly available tool, uh, namely, like, I'm not sure we have capacity to uh, do edits or, um, you know, do a lot of training um, on the tool. But uh, our our dream would be for somebody to, to download it uh, and have it to be useful um, to develop and finance these projects. Yeah, I guess I can speak a little bit on this too. Yeah, love this question. I think we're we're immensely proud of what we've done here and are so excited that it is publicly available and free to access. Um, and, you know, we, we did develop this while we were academics. And so there's a little bit of a, of that lens too, where um, we were not yet practitioners in the energy space. Um, and so this was, this was our own exercise. And, um, and I mean, the impetus is really to allow the democratization of energy access and resiliency for communities. Um, you know, low income and minority communities are disproportionately affected by blackouts and energy loss. And there are real costs of that and real harms. And I've also frequently been left behind by parts of our clean energy transition. And so kind of by directly building this making it free, publishing it, um, and, you know, publishing the model walkthrough, we're, we're hoping that communities can really uh, see that, oh, these projects are maybe viable in our communities, you know, churches or schools or community centers, and will will take the steps to find developers for their projects. And so we kind of, we target this at sort of two different beneficiaries. One might be a project developer who says, oh, you know, we can take this this model and um, we can see that it might start to look pencil out. We can refine it and develop it and build a project. Or a community member who says, oh, I want to dig into this and um, really find out if this is something that could benefit me and my community. Thank you for that, Max. Um, I'm going to get to the next question. This is from uh, Kyle Richmond Crossett. Um, hi, Kyle. <laughs> um, how can I learn more about the model and adapting it to a specific use case? Does the model include instructions for use? Yeah, good point that we didn't we didn't dive too deeply into.
Yeah, so um, another shout out to the model walkthrough that um, Max and I uh, recorded. They, we do include some discussion of like how when you're setting up um, the scenarios, um, how you could change those to answer different types of questions. Um, so definitely check out um, that video that's posted along with the report. And also I'd like to mention, there's a little instruction sheet at the beginning of the report that should tell you where to access a lot of the information that is in either, you know, kind of our assumptions on pricing, like your load curve data and your um, PV watts, your solar exposure data. Okay, uh, next question. This is coming from Kate York. On the question of where green resilience hubs should be developed, it seems like siting is a crucial step influencing IRA incentive eligibility, the microgrid question, and community impact. While you accomplish an impressive amount with this report, it seems like the question of siting isn't as well defined. Additionally, Connecticut is highly segregated racially and socioeconomically. Community centers are often segregated as well. Can you speak to siting criteria and how communities should invest in green resilience hubs in an equitable, equitable way, as well as engagement strategies, thinking of the environmental and climate justice block grants in the IRA? Important question. Yeah, thanks uh, for this question, Kate. Um, oh, sorry. I just, I posted in the chat another resource. So I, I will say there's a, there's a bit more about things to consider when designing a green resilience hub in a report. Uh, we didn't have time to go over today, um, but it's true that, you know, other folks have done a lot of work around um, how to think about siting. So the USDN has um, a resilience hub um, guidance document uh, and it has, you know, a, a section on assessing vulnerability and selecting the service area. Um, so I think that is a really great resource um, that we reference extensively in our report as well. Um, yeah, I guess lastly, um, something that I find really interesting about this is that the Inflation Reduction Act, we've, um, I don't, we'll see how good of a job it does at actually deploying federal funds, but it is targeted at low income communities. It is targeted at tribal lands and energy producing communities. And so hopefully that also encourages siting in places where, you know, um, underprivileged communities do receive the bulk of the benefits of projects like this. Yeah. Last thing I would add is that, so the, the work we have here is really illustrating how to pencil out the project finance for a model like this. And thinking about siting is, you know, in and of itself, such a big question and could have a report as long as this, just for that. Um, I think a big part of that is, well, I think something to, to think about when exploring that question is how do you develop the like, internal uh, awareness in, in communities that historically don't have um, resilience as we're talking about it. And um, yeah, and I, I, I'm thinking like, you know, organizing city officials and uh, to increase awareness of of things like that, or, or community organizers. Uh, yeah, the, there it's a whole conversation that I think is really a critical part of how do you make resiliency accessible and it's really effective. Um, next question. Oh, lost that question. Um, okay. Uh, are avoided emissions in the graph for carbon offsets? Is an is another question there. In the graph for carbon um, offsets. No, so they're they're sort of projected carbon offsets. So we're not actually selling carbon offsets, but we're saying, okay, if this is the value of the avoided emissions over the lifetime of this project. And so that, that's a non-monetized part of the value stack. Right. Um, and so we cut yeah, we calculated that based on the um, the carbon intensity of the Hartford grid and um, then use the social cost of carbon to calculate the total total value of avoided emissions over the lifetime. Right. There's yeah. There's obviously a lot to discuss there. Um, this was a a fun exercise to add to the calculations. Um, I'll just add that it also takes into account that um, that the grid is going to get cleaner over time. So um, 
it takes that into account and then it's those avoided emissions in the future are discounted to the present um, at a discount rate that's different than um, what we used elsewhere in the model. So, you know, social cost of carbon, social discount rate, um, there's a lot to discuss there for sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, it looks like we made it through the questions. Um, what, one that was we, we did touch on this last one is how applicable are your results to other states beyond CT? Are there similar state incentives that can make microgrids pencil out? Max, you did get to that a little bit during the presentation. That's the last question that we haven't touched. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't have a great picture of what other state incentive programs look like. I'm, I mean, I know anecdotally that there are programs to help homeowners buy batteries in a lot of states. Um, and so for some places that might be sort of what this looks like is just a small direct subsidy. Um, but I also think that while the um, Connecticut incentive program was an important part of the value stack, I think that it could likely be offset by an increased ITC coming from developing these on tribal lands or in low income communities or one of those energy communities. Uh, and so I don't think it's crucial, but I think that there are other incentives that are accessible that can make microgrids pencil out and make these green resilience hubs pencil out. Yeah, we definitely um, had big dreams with this and we wanted to create a tool that could be used anywhere in the country, um, but we had to you know, limit ourselves in various ways. Um, and I think choosing a case study in, in Connecticut was one way that we did that. But at some point, you know, we, we definitely dreamt a world where uh, we would build out um, a state incentive program for everyone that exists. Um, but I think for now, you know, if you're if you want to use this and you're not in Connecticut, um, it would take some lifting to um, change the model uh, and adjust it to what your state looks like. We got one more. Actually, I lied. Do you think a nonprofit can realistically understand the model and take this on? If not, what kind of parameters should they be looking for? And that's really the last one. That's the last one. Oof, that's a hard one. Um, I think we all debated this quite a lot and we we changed who we felt our target audience was many times throughout this process. Um, I, I think I'm in the camp where, yes, I think that, you know, someone who understands Excel reasonably well um, and want, and is motivated to learn about this, I think that someone could wade through the model and our report and find find some really meaningful information and learn things about their location and their community. Um, I think it would take more work than someone who works in renewable energy development, for example. But I do think it's possible that you know people at nonprofits could interact with this in a meaningful way. Um, however, I think it's likely that developers um, or other people you know more integrated in renewable energy would have more success interacting with these tools. Yeah, I'll just I'll just add that I think the key word there is um, what kind of partners should they be looking for? Um, and there are partners that exist to help, um, you know, nonprofits navigate complex um, energy projects. Um, so, you know, if you join this webinar and you don't have a lot of background on energy and the Inflation Reduction Act, then this would very well go over your head. Um, and we don't expect, you know, every um, community organization or nonprofit to, to be fully caught up to speed in that. Um, we did try to explain a lot more in our report, some backgrounds about all this stuff. Um, but yeah, um, I think the key word in that question is partners. Um, and there's definitely room for nonprofits to work with partners and navigate these um, kinds of projects. We have one minute left and one last question. Do you have a suggestion for where to send future questions given this is not an ongoing program? Thinking of Joshua Cooper's invitation to partner or others working on this in states who have questions. Yeah, so our emails are on um, the model. Uh, so feel free to send us questions. Um, I will say, you know, we all work full-time jobs and this is not our job anymore. So happy to, to help. Um, but I think we're really trying to empower folks to take this, um, 
to take this model and to take this project and, and run with it. Um, so definitely feel free to ask us questions. Um, I just want to level set expectations that, you know, we all have full-time jobs now and are not uh, graduate students anymore. Um, but yes, our emails, our emails are there. Great, that's it. Thank, Thank you, you all everyone. for attending. This was a lot of fun. Thank you, everybody. Yeah.